Hey, welcome back, everybody. Um, my guest today is, well, you've already heard who my guest is, okay, in the intro. And I am, there comes these interviews that I've been doing over the last five years or so. And all my interviews have been great, but there's some that have been just thought provoking and above all the rest. And I think this is going to be one of those interviews today. And, and Joey, first, thank you so very much for taking time out of your busy schedule to spend a little time with me on my podcast. Peter, it's an absolute pleasure. I appreciate the opportunity. And, and I have to give a shout out to Cassie uh, for helping set this up. Cassie Russian, who um, uh, has been, was a member of Joey Sermon doing a lot of work with, with with Joey over the years and she and I were speaking at a conference together we had known each other for a bit but I didn't know her true background and as she was sharing and I said I'd love to get Joey on the podcast and boom here we are um, I'd like to start off this interview by I, I was reading one of your blog posts and, on LinkedIn and there's this quote that you start off with this is when you see a turtle on top of a fence post chances he did not get up there on his own and, and could you expand i'm thinking we use the word chances i guess he could crawl maybe up there on his own it'd be kind of tough to get to the top of that fence post. but but explain to me that thought process around that quote well the uh, the root of that uh, blog and the thought around that quote is uh we as leaders um we get to where we are uh, because somebody helped us get there. They advocated for us. They supported us. Um, we all need uh, help along the way. And the other part of that is you never stop growing and learning. When you, when you, as a leader, if you ever get to a point where you are, you feel like you've arrived, that's when you're in trouble. Uh, I probably said chances just given everybody, uh, you know, you talk about mindsets all the time, right? Right, right. You, you can't change somebody else's mind. Right. So there are some leaders and some people that might assume that turtle figured out how to get up there by himself. <laughs> but chances are, uh, as you well know, uh, he didn't. <laughs> no, he, he did not. And, and I, I love that metaphor. Yes, we, we, uh, to get to where we want to be. And you were, you served three terms as executive partner for a horn. Uh, accounting firm and um, over the years you had a lot of people help you get to that place advise you and, and, and actually help you when, when those mistakes and, 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 and those those roadblocks and the, and the road and the road fork helped you kind of manage that journey and, and I think that's critical with, with all leadership it's a journey and we have to have other people there to help us achieve that ultimate goal yeah, I couldn't agree with you more. It's absolutely a journey. And certainly what, what we've been able to do at Horn would not be possible without uh, all our team members, our partner group, and just so many champion leaders uh, along the way. So um, you are in the process of, uh, you're no longer the executive uh, partner, and it, you've got another role as a managing partner of strategic business growth but you're also in the process of writing a book. And, and I, I wanna discuss, I, I know there's, you haven't really come up with a, a title per se, but the content of these first early chapters is what really caught my eye in my conversation with, with Cassie. And, and so you were elected in, in 2011, took over in 2012, but I think as she put it, you didn't come in and think about strategic, new strategic business lines or anything like that. You took your, executive partnership partner level and that vision and you look at something differently if you could expand on that for me sir um well we did do uh two things uh we we did change our business model in that we went into focus areas so we decided we weren't going to be everything to everybody and that was uh something that the board uh, embraced and wrapped their arms around early in 2011. We rolled that out in our uh, plan for 2012. But the other thing, the big thing that the board and the partner group embraced uh, was we would uh, 
we had a compelling vision for the kind of firm we wanted to build, the kind of culture. We called it the wise firm. It's uh, based on a, the biblical parable of the wise man and the foolish man. And the wise man built his house on the rock and the foolish man built his house on the sand. And the storms came, the wind blew, the rain pelted down and it washed the foolish man's house away. And we knew that uh, our profession was going to be facing a lot of storms, a lot of challenges in the future, a lot of change. And we wanted a strong foundation that we could, could survive that. And we built that around our purpose and uh, called our, our, our uh, culture, the wise firm. And we made culture number one. That was our number one priority. So we moved away from growth being number one, client service being number one. We moved to culture is going to be number one. And those are really the three that people always are balancing and talking about what should be first. And we put culture first. That's interesting. I was reading a book recently uh, called CEOs Do Three Things. They focus on the culture, they focus on the people, and they focus on the numbers. And, 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 but to your point, culture is always first. So describe how you change the culture within the firm. Well, uh, let me say culture should always be first. It's not always first. It wasn't always first at Horn. Um, and uh, it has to be closely interrelated with serving your clients. In other words, that has to be, they just have to be right there hand in hand. But if you don't take care of people, if you don't love people, they're not going to care and love your customers, your clients. Uh, and that's, that's kind of the secret sauce is that uh, to have a high trust, high performing organization, people have to have a strong sense of belonging. And that's what we were looking for when we started building uh, the wise firm culture. And step one, uh, which is a really hard step, was we had to, uh, we had to face the brutal reality of where we were. We had a good culture and you've heard the enemy of great is good. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, it is nothing more true in building great cultures with high trust and high performing teams. Your enemy is good culture. Oh, good point. Because it's, it's more resistant to that change if we have a good culture. Don't, what was it? If it's not broke, don't fix it, right? Something right. Like Right, right. But you saw that it did need fixing. But you, you said something that, that you said the P word, people, your people, the people that you hire, the people that you employ. It's, it's similar, the similar philosophy that, that Richard Branson has. So he doesn't focus on his clients. He focuses on his people. Hires the right people, treats them well. And by doing so, they will turn around and treat their customers, their clients well. Because you recognize this, we're, the business that we're all in is the people business, first and foremost. Without people, we have no business. And there's a lot of organizations say people are our greatest asset. That's all talk because that's not the way they treat them. So and please continue with, with, with building this, this changing of a, a good culture into a great culture. Um, well, I think you keyed in on the fact that I did say people, and uh, it is about people being number one. There's something I didn't say uh, that you said earlier, which is I didn't say anything about numbers. Um, we, we actually uh, believe and proved that uh, when you put people first and you take care of clients, you'll have all the growth and all the numbers you need. And uh, actually, actually a book I read early on, Patrick Lencioni, who's one of my favorite authors, wrote the book, The Advantage. And in that book, he comes to the conclusion that uh, in the future, because of the speed of technology and the fact that if you get an advantage in six months, your competitor can catch up with you, he pointed out that the only distinctive advantage you can have in the future would be your culture. 
uh, the way you serve clients and the way you, you serve your people. And um, I really bought into that. I, I truly believe that. And we certainly have proved that over the last nine years by focusing on culture. Uh, we've had phenomenal growth. We've uh, had incredible retention of our talent. Uh, <laughs> we created a, there's, um, Peter, there's, a, there's an energy out there that I think people ignore, which I, I call it magnetic energy. Uh, some people call it, you know, being part of a tribe. Um, it is that community of building something bigger than yourself. And people in, we, we look for that. And we look to do that on a team where we have a strong sense of belonging. So when you create a story around your culture, it creates a magnetic energy and a buy-in and an engagement discretionary effort that you don't get when it's plug and play. So that was kind of the vision and compelling story around our journey, which started out with, you know, we, we basically had to sit back and own where we were, what was good. There was, if you had asked people in the profession, they said, yeah, Horn's a great firm, go to Horn. Mm -hmm. But we had, we had accelerating turnover. We were over 20%. One out of five team members were gone every year. But, you know, what was the, what was the message in the profession then? Well, that's just public accounting. Uh, or are people fudge on their numbers? But we were very transparent that that was not acceptable, uh, that we could be better than that. And so our whole journey which again, interests me so much about your podcast, because in 2012, when I addressed the firm, uh, we had come up with the concept that it would be a be better mindset. And uh, that was about all about challenging the status quo, just because we've done it that way before. And so be better, hashtag be better became, we had it, displayed all over the firm, everywhere. Uh, you could give a sticker to another team member if they came up with a better idea of doing something. So it, as you well know, you have to grow that and people have to decide, hey, I'm gonna be part of this Be Better mindset. Yeah, and you, you mentioned uh, hashtag Be Better and hashtag Wise Firm. I did notice we were talking uh, yesterday prior to this, doing this interview, you had two banners in your office, and those were both, both of those two banners. Uh, so, Mike, Mike, you're making a huge cultural shift. In other words, let's use the change word. And, and, and change is difficult for many people to accept. Many people, and I think the words you use is to buy in. So, as you began this titanic shift in culture, I, I, some people, bought in and then others just couldn't grasp it. Could, could you expand on that? Well, that's, uh, that's probably the ugly part of change. Um, and, it, and it's really ugly for everybody because it's like a, a big you. Mm -hmm. When you go to really transform anything, culture, you, your business model, you're gonna immediately go down this slope. Mm -hmm. And you're gonna initially think, gosh, this is harder than I thought it was gonna be. And you go down here, it's gonna be, this is really difficult. And we're making a lot of mistakes. How are we ever gonna get out of this pit that we're in? Mm -hmm. uh, oh my gosh, we should have never done this to, well, we are making a little progress. Uh, man, look how far we've gone the last year. And then all of a sudden you're on this plane where you're accelerating, but you have to go through that. Whether you buy in early or you buy in late, you're gonna go through that U shape, maybe a couple of different times. <laughs> and, and, and change in, in any manner, way, shape or form, you just described it perfectly. 
you, you're going to go down this and why did why did we do this what were we thinking are we were we crazy but then when you when you stick to it and you keep moving every day you just get through every day it just gets a little bit better at some point it just gets a little bit better next thing you know like you said you're, you're in this plane flying going this this is great um and part of this cultural change i believe you said uh, in 2014 you introduced the concept of flexibility into the firm um, which really was a visionary move that really helped over the past 18 to 24 months but if, you could, if you could explain how Hornet introduced flexibility to the firm so um as we formed our be better teams and and by the way i didn't um I didn't do any of it. Our team and our partner group uh, really came together uh, to lay out. Uh, we did identify, you know, the number one challenge in our profession is flexibility where people can integrate their work and their careers, their family. You know, we had core values of God, family, serving, and uh, gratitude. And we knew that it's just as important to serve our families as it is to serve our clients, that that's part of uh, people really having a sense of belonging. And flexibility and the ability to work when, where, and how you wanted to and what worked best for you was very critical that we identified that as the number one challenge. And we knew the number one challenge, but we didn't have any answers. We had none. And so we opened up a collaboration across the firm, open collaboration. Everybody could see it. People posted their ideas, comments. Uh, the team members uh, began to uh, organize around a couple of trends uh, that were there. And we were able to take that and start to develop that. And then we took some uh, study groups and worked on some of that. And we came out and we named it Fearless Unrivaled Flexibility uh, because we wanted people to be, to have the courage to ask for the flexibility they needed in their lives. And it was built a, around commitment, trust, and communication. And those three were the pillars of our Fearless Unrivaled Flexibility. And let me tell you something, Peter. <laughs> You talk about getting down in a deep, deep hole. <laughs> we got down in there because uh, we made every mistake we said we were going to make that we thought we might make. Our team members made them. I made them. I made some of the big ones right out of, of the box. Um, our partner group made some, but uh, we stayed the course. We learned from the mistakes. And when we came out on the other side, uh, when we when we surveyed our people before we put in fearless unrivaled flexibility, 24% of our team said they had the flexibility they needed to manage their lives. Five years later, it took five years. In 2019, when we measured that, there was 92% of the team, including our hourly team members, our administrative staff, where it's limited on what you can do on some flexibility for them. 92% of our team members. So we moved in five year period from 24% to 92%. Holy cow, that's incredible. And, and just by allowing them flexibility to work from a Starbucks, from home, from wherever, uh, were the requirements were, were did, in this flexibility that you had to be in the office on certain days or certain times, or was it just, you know, if you have a client coming in, then clearly you need to be in the office and you need to be dressed appropriately. But outside of that, was there any kind of constraints? The, the constraints were completely around your role. So for example, we have, we have some contracts with some clients where team members actually work at the client's place and they have to honor the client's hours. Uh, and so for those team members, we were able to communicate with the clients that certain team members would be working four day weeks, but we would have 
you know, other resources there. So we had to work through that with some of the clients. Mm -hmm. But for the most part, if you honored your commitment to the team and our clients, if you communicated uh, what, what you're going to be doing, you, if you were flexing, you did have to be available. Now, if you were on vacation or paid time off, mm -hmm. you could disconnect. But if you were flexing, you had to be your own call. It's like being on call, you know, uh, a, being a doctor and being on call, I guess, is a great way to think about it. Uh, so depending on your role, most team members, uh, they either went to four-day work weeks and, and each team had to manage who could do that, you know, whether that was a Monday or a Friday, they might rotate that. We let every team in each focus area kind of determine the best way to manage that. Because let me tell you, the, one of the things that we learned the very first year is that flexibility is unique to the individual. And we'll say that again. <laughs> flexibility is unique to the individual. And until you do it that way, you truly don't empower your people to manage their lives. So, so how did you get, let's say, the managers the, the 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 leaders of the organization um how did you get them to let go of that control of if i see them in the office if, if the cheeks are in the seat i know the work and i can't see them are they watching oprah and eating bonbons i, I have no idea but that, that level of trust you did hear me say it took five years right <laughs> <laughs> I did. <laughs> and you, you heard me talk about how deep the pit got, right? <laughs> oh, it was it was hard because um, you know, we had team members that we 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 rolled it out. We said, this is a privilege that you earn. It's not a right. And you earn that privilege by honoring your commitment, communicating what you're doing, not just doing it and building trust by getting the results that you, you committed to. So um, obviously when people started uh, treating it like a right and taking advantage and you know leaving the team hanging or the client hanging, um, at the same time, we're talking about culture's number one. We want everybody to have a sense of belonging. You can imagine the uh, conflict in, in managers and partners' minds about, well, can I have a hard discussion? Should I have a hard discussion? Uh, and so we just had to reinforce, uh, uh, reinforce over and over again, when people are abusing the policy, you have to have that discussion. Mm -hmm. And you have to take the privilege away until they get it right. Mm -hmm. um, so it was a lot of that. Uh, and it takes one-on-one -on -one discussions. I think uh, one thing that helped us get off to a fast start, one of the funny stories uh, that's told at Horn um, is the fact that when we rolled this out, I knew that, and, and the board, we, we talked about this, that, you know, 70 something percent of initiatives fail because middle management, the people that really direct people every day, the partner group and the managers, that touch everybody's schedule and uh, everybody's role and responsibility every day, really control whether the initiative works. And so uh, I planned uh, two hour meetings across the firm in every office. I met with uh, all the partners and managers and small groups. And I walked into the room, each one of those meetings with my hands physically tied together with a big old rope. So it was very obvious this was not going to be a normal meeting. <laughs> what we were going to talk about was not going to be the norm. And I sat there with my hands tied for the whole first hour while we talked about why, why this was so important to our future, why this would make us distinctive, why this would provide us the ability to respond to clients and, and really be more flexible and why it would help us retain talent. And so after an hour, uh, I let them untie my hands and then we started talking about what, you know, what are your issues? We just had a, a good discussion about why it wouldn't work because okay. uh, there was a lot of that. And so 
from that, we put together best practices and, and went at it. But uh, I think that that launching it with uh, those um, graphic, you know, you know, that I think that picture in people's mind realizing, hey, this is really dependent on me, not Joey, not on the board. This is me. I've got to make this work. I, I love that metaphor. And, and probably still to this day, people still talk about your hands being. Do you still have that rope? You know, at one time I had it. We've changed the offices uh, since then. So I'm going to have to look through a couple of boxes uh, to see if I can find my rope. I, I think you should have that rope and have it framed. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, but, but, but not at home, but you leave it, you leave it in the lobby uh, of, of the, the main corporate headquarters for Horn. And, and that's a talk. Well, what's that? Well, that was, that was the rope that we had Joey's hands tied as we were rolling out this new culture and this new flexibility program. That, that's a great talking point. Well, it, it might be, but I'd be scared they want to tie my hands again, Peter. Um, <laughs> I, I was surprised. Well, what surprised me is they actually untied your hands at the time. <laughs> <laughs> so, so let's fast forward to, in this story, to March of 2020. And we're now in, under this, we've heard the word pandemic, global pandemic. We've got quarantine, we've got social distancing, we've got people fighting for toilet paper. Uh, we've got hoarding and all of a sudden people who worked in offices had to go work from home and then families had to be at home and you're trying to raise your kids and school them and then trying to do your job and, and and as everybody was grappling with this new normal you guys didn't have to grapple so hard well, I would, I would say that we were certainly very blessed. Um, it's one of those coincidences um, where, where God had us prepared, uh, even though we didn't know that. Um, you know, the hard part, uh, though, especially for, and I think a lot of this fell on the working moms. Uh, we did a lot of study groups around that, put out a lot of help aids. But even though we were prepared and overnight you know, we flipped a switch and a thousand people were working remotely and they were very productive uh, from, from the very start. We still had to grapple with all of the people issues and how people's lives had changed. Um, and, you know, the working moms and the parents that were, were having to help homeschool uh, as well as do their other work. That was, that's a big hurdle that you, you, you can't really prepare for, and nobody that I know of was prepared for. But what we did is we we recognized that early on. I think part of that is the mindset of people first, and we were putting out information immediately about how to help manage the, your day and how what some of the best practices around that were. Well, I and as you're describing this, and you said it, I went back into my mind going, well, if you build the culture correctly, as you have, those challenges aren't as daunting as if you're dealing with them for the very first time. And you see, when you put people first, then what issues are they running into on a day in and day out in this new normal? I mean, I, I've been working from home for, for over 10 years, but all of a sudden I have as, as I like as I like to call them, I have two new FTEs in my house. And, and you know what? By, by April, I was putting them both on warning. And, 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 I, and I, tried to, I tried to, you know, off-board them in May, but they, they didn't leave. They kept staying. <laughs> <laughs> and, 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 and bandwidth. And it was all those little issues that became because everybody was, you know, quarantined what was a huge challenge as well as trying to maintain a, a, a sense of, of business and, and and a sense of how do I help serve my clients during this time that what can I do to help them without having to charge them any money, just be there to serve them. And, and it sounds like you guys had, had that mindset and were there to help serve those clients as well as your internal clients in, in order to survive those real early tough times. Yeah. Tough, tough for everybody. And, um, 
you know, one of the great things that came out of that is that more people had access to leadership because, you know, uh, we started communicating even more, started Zooming every week with everybody, uh, giving them updates. Uh, but something happened there that, uh, and this, this doesn't have to be a pandemic. This really gets back to why should we go through that, that U-curve, that sloth, that swamp <laughs> to, to get to be a, a great culture is that when you have high trust, high sense of belonging, that tribe effect, people spent less time worrying about was the horn team going to gather up and keep everybody safe and they were able to spend some constructive time on okay our clients are hurting right now too in fact we got some that their doors are closed mm -hmm. and how do we help them so the power of a high performing team with high trust in that tribe that community however you want to describe it mm -hmm. uh, that community allows you to move past uh, that initial fear that hits everybody. I think people felt safer that they knew Horn was gonna do what we needed to do to keep our, our families intact and safe. And, and, and I, I, I take it during, during this time, but the other firms that I've talked to during this time, some of them kind of maintained the status quo, but others went out and really helped their clients, even helped the bankers understanding these PPP loans and, and, and all this, you know, being there to help get them the, the resources that, that they need. And the accounting profession, I don't believe, I haven't seen any stats on this, maybe, maybe you know, I don't know if, if turnover is not the right word, but, but how many did, did firms have to lay off people in order to, you know, maintain the, their, their bottom line? Or were they able to maintain their, hopefully the good firms like yourself saw that the people, we need them, we'll go find a way to, to keep them on board because they have lives, they have families, they have required, you know, uh, things that, that they need to take care of. I think I just kind of butchered that question there, but I think you understood what I was trying to get yeah. at. <laughs> uh, but it was a very, very uncertain time. Um, you know, we made some, um, some staff changes, uh, very minimum, but we did make some staff changes. Uh, some functions that we couldn't see being full-time, we put people on a, a, a shorter work week. Uh, so we made some changes around that until we could get our feet under us and see what was going on. But uh, in 2020, you know, we ended up hiring, uh, you know, several hundred more people than we started the year with. Uh, we had phenomenal growth. Most, most CPA firms experienced some growth during uh, the pandemic, during 2020, because there was so much to do. The PPP loans, the, the clients had lots of need. If you were out there talking to your clients, even if it was on Zoom, there were needs that you could address. And so, we ended up, one, because we were immediately productive uh, in March of 2020. Uh, I think because our team wasn't as, as scared. Uh, we didn't have fear immobilizing us as much as maybe some groups had. So we were already moving and anticipating what are some of the new needs of the clients. We just had phenomenal organic growth in 2020. That's great. I mean, it's, I, I love the word phenomenal um, because that, that's, you, you don't hear that very much in 2020, that, that, that type of growth. But once again, it goes back to the culture that we create, creates those opportunities. The culture that we create it, it, it empowers and motivates our people to go sometimes way, way beyond in helping our clients and, and, and with their businesses and, and their lives. Um, I seriously, I could, I don't want to, I've, I've taken up probably more than enough of your time. And, and I, I hope someday soon that our paths cross because then I, I want to sit down and just continue this conversation with you. 
because it's something very unique in the accounting profession. Uh, it, it's something that has been desperately needed. Uh, but I do have one, one question for you. What challenge do your people currently have today that, 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 that has been still there maybe since even through this change in culture as they deal with their clients? Are, are you asking me, have we developed a skill or a talent that somewhat different from? But yes, and that skill and talent being, and, and, and I have been a, 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 a better term, a crusade for a, a, a number of years. The reason why I wrote my second book, Taking the Number Out of Numbers, is that we in the accounting profession speak a foreign language of accounting just like Japanese, just like Chinese, just like Greek and Italian. And we're out there talking with our clients. Now, some, some of our clients are well-versed. We're talking directly with the CFOs, they're, they're, but there's some clients out there, maybe nonprofit board, maybe entrepreneurs who don't have that background that when we're speaking to them, it's deer in the headlights and, and trying to make that better connection with them. Um, and, I, I hear story after story after story of, of people going, well, I left my CPA today. I had a meeting with he or her today. No idea what they said, but I trust them. So we'll just move forward. And we're going, well, there's something missing in that, 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 that ability to translate that complex language of ours, accounting into plain English. Right. Uh, I, I, do you, I, I see you smile. And so you, you guys still have that same challenge out there. Yeah, I mean, I think you have that challenge. Uh, it's a, uh, certainly a challenge we had at Horn that we started working on. It's certainly one that's uh, common to the profession because we, we have been successful the last hundred years by being technicians and regulatory uh, gurus, gurus and historians. Right. And that is not where the market is. And so we have been going into these meetings and we're talking all these technical terms rather than talking to the client about their business. So we actually did a lot of training around that. Uh, we do role playing. Uh, if you have a big meeting with a client, a, a big presentation at Horn, it's now a practice to do role playing. We do after action reviews, what could have been done better so that we're changing that language and the expectation around what we call collaboration. So right. that's, that's the skill set that we tried to build. And the other, uh, I know you know uh, Tom Hood. Yes. Um, great friend of mine. One of the things that uh, Tom Hood did for us was get us connected to Daniel Burris. Yes. And we trained our organization uh, with the anticipatory organizational principles. Mm -hmm. And so now that's part of our vocabulary and it's uh, very common for you seeing our team members anticipating the opportunity or the next challenge before the client does. Uh, that's great. It, it, as I was formulating that question in my head, that my inner voice was going, they're already doing this beat, but this is going to be great because they've already recognized this challenge that's out there and they've already put pieces in place where I think other firms haven't even recognized that lack, that, that difference in that communication. It sounds like English when it comes out, right? When you say depreciation to an accountant, they go, oh, that's the value I lose in my car when I drive it off the new car lot. And you're going, no, no, no. It's a systematic allocation of an asset over time. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> so so I, 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 I applaud you guys. I, 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 this has been a, a wonderful conversation, but I cannot leave without asking, is Oliver around? Yeah, Oliver's around. Um, thankfully, my wife came and uh, shut my office doors or I would, I'd put him on screen for you, but uh, Oliver's my little Yorkie and we, he's about 16 months old and He's my best buddy. He's got a bed right up here on my desk. And when I go to work, he comes to work. Hey, he was there earlier when we first started. And by the way, Joey did say that 
Oliver has his own Instagram account, Oliver Gene Haven. So as, as soon as I'm, we're done with this interview, I'm going out to Instagram and liking it and I'm going to start following Oliver. Awesome. Uh, <laughs> he's been known to be seen driving and picking out mattresses. And at Halloween, he had hold of a cow's tail, which is a pretty funny video too. So <laughs> he's, he's got quite a personality. Oh, and, and so do you, sir. You you have a wonderful personality, and, and I I love your 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 vision, your, your humor, um, your, your foresight. And I told you this yesterday. If I was a lot younger, I would love to come and work under, uh, at your firm because what what everything that you put in place was the exact opposite of everything I experienced during my years in public accounting, which wasn't long, but. I kind of probably stayed in public accounting under the culture of horror. <laughs> <laughs> Be careful what you wish for. <laughs> oh. <laughs> uh, that, that's that's uh, mighty kind. Uh, I certainly appreciate you saying that, but it's uh, it's a result of uh, a fantastic team and a great partner group. And uh, and most of all, uh, you know, we we believe in giving God credit because He has blessed our firm immensely. Absolutely. And thank you so very much for your time. I look forward to when our paths cross. And uh, I guess I, it's that time of year. Happy Thanksgiving. I hope you have a wonderful holiday season this year. And, and 2022 far exceeds your expectations uh, by the end of 2022 than when they started. All right. Well, thank you. And happy Thanksgiving to you. And, and again, it, this has been a pleasure.